from a small, unremarkable airfield, one intrepid adventurer is about to attempt an awe-inspiring world first, blasting himself into aviation history. Meet pilot Eve Rossi, otherwise known as Jetman. He's aiming to be the first to fly across the English Channel using a single jet-propelled wing attached to his back. His homemade wing is prone to spinning out of control, but now there's no turning back. With clear skies overhead, only a sudden change in the weather or mechanical failure can stop him now. Jetman is ready for takeoff at Calais Dunkirk Airport, ready to launch himself into the record books. Ready to realize a dream that began far from Calais and the English Channel here. A humble model aircraft shop near Geneva Airport. It specializes in the design and manufacture of carbon fiber composites. Perfect for model airplanes, and as Eve has discovered, ideal for building the flying jet wing that will launch him into aviation history. Today, Eve has brought his wing to the shop to adjust the alignment of the four turbine engines. It's a precision job, just one or two millimeters off and the engines can throw the wing into a deadly spin. We must to put it exactly with the angle of the rector. If the, the angle is not right, it could uh, fly bad. At first, wingmaker and designer Alain Ray had his doubts about Yves Rossi and the former fighter pilot's pioneering project. I was thinking uh, exactly what you think of the first time. He's a little bad, a little, come on, dit fou. Uh, mad, crazy. Uh, he's a little crazy, yes. But he come by me with a little dessin. Based on this little design, Alain fabricated a wing that's strong yet lightweight. A carbon fiber core is covered by an ultra-light yet ultra-tough foam and fiberglass skin. The jet engines were built for model airplanes, but they're not toys. Each small turbine is capable of generating 20 kilograms of thrust, enough power to turn Eve Rossi into a human rocket. The alignment of the engines must be exact. If just one engine is a couple of millimeters out, Jetman could lose control. To get the kind of precision he needed, Eve Rossi also designed and built an instrument that uses a laser to position the engines. It's first I'm, I'm looking where about how they are. Pas mal. Quatre millimètres, t'es trop à droite. You see, like that, it seems it's, it's not bad, it's okay. The designers of the model engines never dreamed that their turbines would be mounted on a wing which would be attached to a person. So Eve had to come up with a solution to protect himself. Now, each engine is shielded with a sleeve of black Kevlar. So that uh, if a turbine explodes, the pieces uh, don't go to my little ass, <laughs> but are going out behind. I, I wouldn't like it that. So it's the important part. engines and homemade wing hold together for a pioneering world-first jet-powered flight over the channel. You're about to see why this daring dot over one of the world's busiest shipping lanes could so easily end in disaster. The mid-air emergencies they hope won't happen again. a bid to make aviation history still to come on Jetman the whole story
This is Calais Dunkirk Airport on the French side of the English Channel. And this is Dover, 36 kilometers away. Between them, the cold, treacherous stretch of water that jetman Yves Rossi will attempt to cross on his homemade jet wing. This is the landing zone in Dover, where he'll parachute at the end of what's expected to be just over a 12-minute flight. South Foreland Lighthouse is a striking landmark on the White Cliffs of Dover. It's an historic location, the site of Marconi's wireless experiments, and it may lay claim to another historical first, if Eve manages to pilot his way there safely. It's a dream he's been preparing for, for a very long time. The veteran ex-army fighter pilot and commercial airline captain has the green light for takeoff. After a series of test flights, he's made the distance, but not the time. His longest flight amid breathtaking alpine scenery near his Swiss home was two minutes short of the channel crossing target. He faces the same potentially life-threatening dangers as the pioneering aviators of yesteryear. Engine failure, a shortage of fuel, unpredictable weather, but dealing with danger and managing risks are all part of the mission for this inspirational Swiss airman. I like to manage the risk. When you know there are risks, there are problems, and you find the way to to slalom in between. It's fun, it's challenging. Jetman has had to bail out several times to save himself and his wing. Images of his spectacular test flights have been shared by broadcasters and websites across the globe, but not the mid-air emergencies where things could have gone terribly wrong. danger begins before he even leaps from the plane. The turbine engines are ignited inside the launch plane. And wherever there's jet fuel, there's always a risk of fire. Even a brief flare-up like this one during wind tunnel testing could be catastrophic in flight. That's why every person on board the launch plane must be an experienced parachutist. And after Jetman leaves the launch plane, the dangers multiply. In July of this year, during a warm-up flight, one of the engines died, throwing the wing into a violent spin. Eve was forced to open his parachute before he could shut down the other three engines and narrowly avoided burning the lines of his parachute and disaster. Eve estimates he's come close to death 20 times. He says he's still alive because he only jumps from high altitudes and that gives him the time to solve problems before he gets too close to the ground. On several occasions when he's lost control, he's had to jettison the wing before it could ensnare him in a deadly spiral. Crossing the channel presents some new dangers for Eve. He'll be flying over water. And if he has to make an emergency landing, or if he runs out of fuel, he'll splash down in some of the busiest shipping lanes in the world, in cold and treacherous waters. With only an inflatable life jacket to keep him afloat, until a rescue boat can fish him out of the sea. But in the event of an accident, the ex-Swiss Army pilot is confident that his many years of military survival training will save him. If I cannot cross the channel, I don't know, I have to land in the water one kilometer of the coast. It's a pity, but safety-wise, it's not a problem. We will have a chase boat, chase helicopter, I know, if I land in the water, I will not kill myself. 
So what precautions have been taken to limit the chances of a tragedy unfolding above the channel? Every flight of the Jetman begins with the same basic series of checks and precautions. The first is to fireproof the airplane. Few things are more dangerous than igniting four turbine engines inside a small plane, 2,500 meters above the ground. So before takeoff, Yves and pilot Jean-Marc Coulomb attach a fire-resistant shield to the cabin floor. Yves Ross's jet wing has two main fuel tanks and two reserve tanks. Wind and weather permitting, they hold enough fuel to keep him flying for about 12 minutes. And that's just enough to make it across the channel, but there's little to spare. In the unlikely event of an emergency, the next obvious check is the parachute. Like most experienced skydivers, Eve packs his own parachutes, a main and a reserve. This handle is my life. If I have a problem, I can pull this handle. I stay only with the harness on me. The wing goes away and I open my parachute. I still have a reserve. The wing has its own smaller parachute. So if it has to be jettisoned, it won't be destroyed on impact. The next pre-flight step is the all important warm up. Jetman spends a few minutes stretching before every flight. With nothing but his own body to steer the wing, he has to be mentally and physically relaxed. It's very, very sensitive. Uh, you have re really to be uh, cool and relaxed because uh, just, uh, for example, at the beginning, I, I didn't know that it was so reactive. I wanted uh, to, to say hello to the guys in formation with me, and this, it turns. So every move I do, it's always relaxed, and really, when I want to, to, to see something, it's like that. Because if you do a fast moves, then it becomes unstable. Any sudden movements or twitches could see him spin out of control. Then, there's the pre-flight briefing. Jetman and his team review the flight plan, so everyone knows what to do if something goes wrong. If he's forced to abort the flight, jettison the wing, or make an emergency landing, there's a contingency plan to deal with it. In flight, the wing feels lighter than air, but on the ground, fully fueled, it weighs about 55 kilograms. Imagine the weight of two extra large, extra heavy suitcases. After takeoff, the launch plane will take five to 10 minutes to reach the right altitude. About 2,500 meters, or a little over 8,000 feet. If all goes well, the ignition system will fire up the four engines simultaneously. But if there is a problem, the mechanic can override the system and perform a manual start. Once the engines are running safely, he's ready to fly. Now the drills and tests are over. Instead of flying over familiar territory around the Swiss Alps, Jetman Yves Rossi has to conquer a stretch of treacherous water that's been a magnet for adventurers since the dawn of aviation. We call it the English Channel. The French call it La Manche, or the Sleeve. Either way, it's about 560 kilometers long and varies in width from 240 to just 34 kilometers between Dover and Calais. For centuries, it's been a key barrier and a natural line of defense for both countries. But by the early 1900s, spectacular advances in aviation suggested the inevitable, that this once formidable body of water would soon be conquered by air. 
In October 1908, Lord Northcliffe and the publishers of the Daily Mail offered a £1,000 prize to the first pilot to fly across the channel. In July of 1909, three men presented themselves at Calais to compete for the prize. Hubert Latham was the first to attempt the aerial crossing in his Antoinette monoplane on the 19th of July. Hubert Latham décide de tenter le raid avec son avion Antoinette, construit par le Vavasseur. À 6h45, il prend le départ. But after flying for just 11 kilometers, his engine died and Latham had to be rescued. The second contender, Count Charles de Lambert, never took off. He crashed his plane during a test flight and was forced to withdraw from the competition. Then, on the 25th of July, at 4.41 a.m., a French inventor and engineer, Louis Blériot, took off and headed for the English coast. But without any instruments on board, not even a compass, he drifted off course to the north, passed over. But just before he ran out of fuel, he saw an opening in the cliffs and landed. His feat was celebrated across Europe. The historic crossing promoted the visionary author H.G. Wells to write, this is no longer, from the military point of view, an inaccessible island. It was as if a single event had suddenly redrawn the map. From then on, Crossing the English Channel became the goal for daredevils, thrill-seekers and inventors everywhere. The next Channel Crossing milestone was made on the 23rd of August 1910. American John Bevins Moisson became the first pilot to take passengers across the Channel, his mechanic and his cat. Then in 1912, Harriet Quimby became the first woman to fly across the Channel. In 1926, Gertrude Adele became the first woman to swim across the channel in 14 and a half hours. The first hovercraft crossing in 1959 from Calais to Dover was made in two hours, three minutes. The 32 kilogram Gossamer Albatross was the first human powered aircraft to cross the channel. American Brian Allen pedaled his airplane for three hours. In 2003, Austrian Felix Baumgartner glided across with nothing but a small carbon fiber wing strapped to his back. Now, five years on, another pioneering airman is attempting another historic channel conquest. Okay. Today, Jetman Yves Rossi is all set for his record attempt to become the first man to fly a homemade jet-powered wing across the English Channel. A dream realized in a small village near Geneva, Switzerland, where Jetman calls home. He may be a daredevil adventurer in his spare time, but at work, Eve Rossi takes to the skies in more conventional craft. For the last 20 years, he has flown airbuses for Swiss International. He was also a fighter pilot in the Swiss Army. And it's his passion for pure flying power that feeds his one true obsession, the wing that will allow him to soar across the sky and over the English Channel. His garage is no ordinary amateur workshop, but an aviation invention and design center. And it all began when he was just 13 years old. As a kid, I was really impressed from the airplanes, especially the, 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 the jets. He was born in 1959 in the Swiss village of Neuchâtel. But then, one day in 1972, the teenager's life took an unexpected turn. I was about 13. The really, the switch was at an air show. A display of aerial acrobatics by the Swiss Army flying team would have profound and life-changing impact. It was on the crowd, speed and sound. The spectacle of the supersonic jet show struck a deep chord in the teenager. You know, they do like, uh, uh, at the end of the show, they do an, uh, like a bomb like that. They go in a direction like that, and the solo came straight on me. I was alone. And suddenly, 
over my head. And a few seconds later, was behind the, the mountains. And I thought, this guy in that airplane, he should have such an emotion. I want to become a pilot like him. Just four years later, at the age of 17, Eve joined the Swiss Army. By the age of 21, he'd become a fighter pilot. Crazy. It was better than a dream. It was like natural, like an extension of myself. Eve Rossi was living his childhood dream, flying fighter jets. The goal, the real goal at this time for me was the Mirage. Such a fantastic machine. And again, it was better than in the dream. After serving six years as an army pilot, he decided it was time for a change. He swapped the joystick of a sleek fighter for the controls of an airliner. Being a commercial pilot gave him a chance to see the world. I was uh, on long range on Jumbo 747. It was very motivating to steer such a big machine. Right? It's three, 360 tons. While he relished the responsibility of flying large, long-haul aircraft, he also yearned for the speed and power of supersonic jet fighters. I'm looking for these contrast, generally in my, in my life, and uh, also in aviation. Having mastered most conventional aircraft, he launched himself into the more raw forms of flight, like hang gliding. When you are in an airplane, you are in a box. It's closed. It's fantastic, but you have no contact with the element. With a hang glider or paraglider, that was a very simple way to fly and to be really in the element air. Soon, hang gliding was followed by sky surfing. And then, when Yves Rossi started to design his own wings, he found that he was getting closer and closer to his original dream being able to fly like a bird, with his body forming the fuselage, and nothing but the open sky surrounding him. Now, Jetman will leap from his launch plane and try to make the 36 kilometers across the channel using a homemade jet-powered wing.
Swiss pilot they call Jetman is just moments away from launching himself into a pioneering attempt to make aviation history. After his jump plane reaches the critical altitude around two and a half thousand meters, or a little over 8,000 feet, Eve Rossi will ignite four model airplane turbine jets, then leap out over Calais. then hopes to be the first to make it 36 kilometers across the channel to Dover using his homemade jet-powered wing. But he faces unpredictable winds, relying on a wing that has the propensity to stall and spin out of control. To give himself the best possible chance of making it over the channel, Jetman ventured into the howling, fan-forced tempest of the Ruag wind tunnel in Emmen, Switzerland. At the end of a tunnel almost a kilometer long, two massive propellers generate wind speeds of up to 250 kilometers an hour. This would be an invaluable test for Jetman and his homemade flying machine. In an extreme yet precisely controlled environment, usually reserved for high-tech civilian and military aviation, I go in a wind tunnel actually to learn because I still don't know exactly why and uh, how it works. I have to quit my garage and come in something more scientific. Right. With human test objects. <laughs> to replicate true flying conditions, much of the testing had to be conducted with Jetman strapped under his wing. He's an integral part of the aircraft. The wing has no steering controls, no flaps, no rudder. It's Jetman's body that provides the steering. Well, he turns by just putting his head on the one or the other side, and sometimes he assists that with his hand, sometimes even with the leg. He's, he, he's acting as a, as a human fuselage, so to say, and that's, that's quite unique. Here, Engineers instruct Jetman to make the same controlled, subtle body movements he uses to control direction and elevation in real flight. And while the wing won't really move, the computer will analyze how he influences the wing's aerodynamics. 